Good morning, Valley Church. My name is Mackenzie Moorhead and I'm the LDP for the Valley students. If you are joining us here today on Facebook, make sure you interact with our online hosts. On September 5th, we will be starting our next sermon series, Shaken to the Core. This series is going to focus on if you shook everything down to the core at the Valley Church, what would we be about? It's going to be an awesome series and we really hope you can join. That will be on September 5th. Today we are going to be continuing on our third week of our sermon series, Winning the Mind Over. Pastor Lindsay is going to have a great message for us today. here. We are in week three of Winning the Mind War. And I'll be honest with you, I have been looking forward to this series for several months. Because the truth of the matter is, we all struggle sometimes with what is going on up here. We can be smiling, we can be excited, we can go throughout our day. And yet we all know what it feels like to have that hamster wheel going and going and going. And if you're anything like me, maybe it's not until you go to lay down to sleep and the hamster hops on the wheel and you just can't fall asleep. Well, I was anxious to say the least when I realized what week I had, week three. We're gonna talk about calming anxiety. Well, isn't that interesting? Ironic even, right? I was anxious about talking about anxiety. Because in full transparency, I have struggled with anxiety most of my life. In in fact, I've shared this with some people, but I used to, in my late teen years, early 20 years, I would wake up and I would have nail marks in the palm of my hand because I slept with my fists clenched. I just dealt with so much anxiety that I really didn't know how to deal with. And and more importantly, I didn't really know what God had to say about it. And as a Christ follower, I have been since I was 19, even then I still didn't know what does Christ have to say. Because so often we can just become resolved to live in the anxiousness or the worry and not realize that Christ truly desires for you to be free. So week three, we're going to talk about calming anxiety. So come on in, sit down, get your cup of coffee if you want. Let's just get real with each other and talk about what it means to calm it, deal with it. And frankly, I'm going to be honest with you, let's eradicate anxiety from our lives. Now, maybe you know what those anxious feelings feel like. Elevated heart rate sweaty palms, shaking limbs, difficulty focusing, maybe even some of you feel sick to your stomach. Now, as a former English teacher, I have watched anxiety grip my students every time I tell them that we're gonna go and do a speech. But we're not just talking about this temporary anxiety that occurs, right? We're talking about a more persistent anxiety. In fact, even as I was studying and preparing for this particular message, a few things we want to consider here is that worry and anxiety are not the same. Even though people use those words synonymously, you may even hear me use those words synonymously, worry is temporary and it arises in certain situations, but anxiety is persistent. And stress and anxiety are also not the same. Stress is a response to a situation. And like worry, it is typically temporary. Anxiety is what happens when we allow stressful situations 
to go unresolved and likewise it becomes persistent. As I started to dig into that, I realized there's a very consistent word here, persistent. The thing is, is that we're not intended or designed to live under a barrage of anxiety. We're not made to live with the debilitating results of anxiety, which often for some people, maybe even some of you listening today, has resulted in depression. See, God has bigger plans for us. So while you may experience worry and stress from time to time, relax, take a deep breath, that's normal. In fact, those are actually usually good responses. It lets us know, hey, this is important. I should probably take this seriously. But this morning we wanna dive deeper into what God says about calming anxiety. And quite frankly, like I told you, Let's eradicate it. Let's get rid of anxiety in our lives once and for all. If you agree with me, put amen in the comments right now because I know that as I am learning, because I'm still learning, my life is a whole lot better because of the eradication of worry, the relieving of worry than it is to keep it here. So with the word persistent in mind, let's turn to God's word and consider what the Apostle Paul has to say about it. The Apostle Paul and Timothy are writing a letter to those who live in Philippi. They had planted a church there and like many of Paul's letters, wanted to do two things. Encourage them as well as remind them about what they had once learned when they were there. And it's important for us to know that this letter was written to those who already understood the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And you're going to see why I want you to understand that right now. Because as Paul and Timothy are writing to encourage these believers, it, it, we can often take this topic of anxiety and forget who we're talking to and how they may feel about it. See, without Jesus, my friends, we remain shackled to the things of this world. Paul understood shackles, both literal and figurative, but because of the Holy Spirit living in him, he understood freedom in his spirit, even if his flesh was afflicted. This is the kind of freedom I want for you today. And it starts with a choice to relinquish control to Jesus. Confess your sins before him and accept his saving grace by faith. It's the most important decision you will make in your life because it's the decision that leads to eternal life, joy everlasting, and peace that surpasses understanding. In fact, I would go as far to say that I have nothing more important to you that to say to you this morning than that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be set free from sin and shame, restored and renewed by His saving grace, and then you can understand what it means to have calm in the anxiety. If that's you today, we're going to just stop right now, because there, like I said, there is literally nothing more important than this right now. That if you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would ask you right now in the comments to raise your hand, put your name, make a statement. And one of our hosts is going to come alongside you in a private chat room and pray with you. Because friends, that is what this is all about. So if you are ready to make that decision, you say, oh, but Lindsay, I don't know. I mean, what about this and what about that? I want you to stop all the what abouts and the what ifs and just say yes to Jesus. I confess I have sinned and fallen short. Love me, Jesus, full and complete. Put that in the comments right now and your host will be praying with you and for you and then we can do life together. Isn't that amazing? Put all the what ifs behind you and join me this morning. All right. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that I'm celebrating with you right now, along with all the angels and saints of heaven. 
So let's talk about what living in that freedom looks like. Because that's really where Paul is going in this letter to the people in Philippi and then to all of us. He's talking about what it means to live free. And he just happens to include this piece about anxiety. These verses that we're going to look at today are commonly known and widely published, but I have also been in situations where uttering these verses creates a lot of frustration and anger. This is why it's important for us to understand that Paul was writing to Christ's followers, and it's only through Christ that this is possible. All that time that I toiled with anxiety in my own life, gripping my hands so tight, creating ulcers and sickness because of anxiety, it was because I was trying to do it on my own. So here we go. Here are our verses from Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. All right, so let's break this down. You've probably heard these scriptures before. Maybe you have them inscribed on a pillow. I don't know. But we, we've all been, we've heard these before. So let's talk about what Paul's saying. So he starts out with saying, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And some of you right now want to click off and say, not possible. So I'm going to challenge us this morning. Are you ready? Let's flip it for a second. Let's just take Paul's words and flip for a second. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Seems more possible now, doesn't it? That if in fact I'm praying about everything, then I probably would be worrying less about other things. We often read, don't worry about anything, and we stop there and say, it's impossible, and yes, you're right. It's impossible for me in my flesh. It's impossible for you in yours. But it is not possible for God, our creator, who lives in you. He can do it. And he will help us do it. So what's Paul trying to say? Remember, worry is temporary, but anxiety is persistent. So other translations read, don't be anxious about anything, or be anxious about nothing, be anxious for nothing. Paul's talking about that persistent nag of anxiousness, and he's letting us know that it needs to be met by an equally persistent call to prayer. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, which is another one of Paul's letters, he writes, never stop praying. So if we meet our persistent anxiety with persistent prayer, we will see results. His peace guarding our hearts and minds. See, not just our hearts, but the mind as well. So what do we pray about, right? Maybe you're thinking, okay, well, Lindsay, I do pray. I pray over my dinner. I pray before I go to bed. I pray when I'm having a bad day. Well, Paul tells us, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Okay, I'm going to offer another suggestion. Reverse this order. Thank him first often helps us refocus our needs. See, when we spend time in prayer thanking him, you're going to begin to realize that the needs list, that thing, that long list that you thought you needed, 
really are more wants and that many of your needs are actually being met. Friends, this changed my prayer life. That if I sat down and I started by thanking him first before I went into the litany, it is amazing how all of a sudden your heart becomes filled and whatever it is that's, that you're anxious about or you're worried about, frustrated, angry, oh, he meets you in it. And all of a sudden the solution becomes clear. The peace, even when there's no solution, becomes clear because we honored him for what he's already done as a testimony that we trust him for what he's going to do. See, the result of this peace is that cannot be explained in any other way other than Jesus, which I'm pretty sure was the design. Here's why. Some of the situations you may be facing may not have changed, but there is now a knowing that what will occur in the days or hours to come has his hand on it and not your own. That is peace. Maybe you've been in situations, maybe you're in one right now and you say, Lindsay, I've been praying for years. Yes, I hear you. More importantly, God hears you. And I would tell you that if it brings you anxiety, it brings you fear, it brings you frustration or anger, be persistent in that prayer. Trusting that God hears you and that his timing is perfect. See, what I love about this portion of the letter, though, is Paul doesn't just leave us with these two-step process, right? But rather, he's reminding us that in order to maintain a distance from this persistent behavior, we have to change the way we respond every day. I, honestly, it'd be easier if Paul had just cut it off there, right? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Give him thanks and tell him what you need. Done. Bo. But he doesn't do that. Because you and I are fickle. Or as I used to tell my students, we're like fickle pickles. Because the reality is, is that we do that. Maybe you're going to do that right now. And a few days from now, something's going to happen. And the old habits, the ones we learn, the ones that we build up over time and how we deal with anxiousness will come flooding forward. So we have to learn a new behavior. And this is what Paul continues for. And, and I'm thankful that the Apostle Paul told us what to do about the behavior of anxiety, not just the moment of anxiousness. So he goes on and he says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Fix. The word fix means to affix, settle on, concentrate, focus. We cannot assume that God's going to do all the work. In, in fact, we're in a relationship together, so it's a reciprocal relationship that requires us to work forward even if some days we feel like we're going backwards. I was reading one of my devotions by Oswald Chambers, and he says this, the moment you're willing for God to change your nature, his recreating forces will begin to work. Not just change a behavior or a moment, but change your very nature, your very way of living and breathing and doing. It goes back to what I said at the beginning about surrender. So let's read through the list of things we're supposed to focus on. Things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. So that's probably going to leave some of you feeling like, what's left in life, huh, Lindsay? Well, let's keep in mind that the reward is becoming unshackled from anxiety. Living a life free to roam without the baggage. So if TV has to go, social media has to go, you need to unfollow some people, you need to let go of some friendships, then it's time to place your trust in the one that makes each step taken toward him possible. Trust me, I got my things too. 
right? I, I got my shows that I like to watch. I've got people that maybe make me laugh on Instagram. But if they're not keeping me in a place where I am drawing forever from the one who sets me free, then they got to go. You know, they've got to go. And I believe today, even as you're listening, that thing is coming to the forefront of your mind. As it comes to your mind, please know this. It's there because the Holy Spirit wants to set you free from it. There's no shame and guilt in the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we read through the list one more time, we're gonna, I, I want to ask a question. And I want you to ask this question. What do you want to say to me, Jesus? And asking this question, we're giving Jesus permission to stop us on a word and show us what needs to change so that we can fit. Just take a minute and say, Jesus, what do you want to say to me? Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. He's so faithful to answer us in this. I know you heard it. I know there was a word in which you could circle right now and say, oh, he's telling me I need to focus on things that are lovely or things that are pure. There's somewhere in your life where the light of Jesus has not yet shined because we've not fixed our thoughts there. No shame or guilt when it comes to Jesus. He's showing it to you because he loves you and he wants you to live in the freedom he paid for. The only thing you need to consider now is the next thing he asks you to do. If it's stopping, starting, continuing something, he'll be clear because he, his desire for us is to think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I'll be honest. The only thing worth thinking about that is excellent and worthy of praise is Jesus Christ. And when we focus on those things, when I learned to focus on those things, the grip got loosened. The stomach stopped churning. The headaches stopped coming because Christ is freedom. Paul's final words are a reminder to each of us that we need to be in community. While he's reminding them of this example in life, we too need to be with people that are ahead of us on the journey of faith. It's where we get wise counsel. We see examples of living by faith and not by anxiousness. And where we too can lead someone who's coming up behind us. In fact, it was in my early 30s, I was dealing with so much, it was one of the hardest years of my life. And I remember saying to a wise Christian woman who looked at me and we were having honest conversations. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to worry. I'm just going to be anxious the rest of my life. And she said, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm looking at you telling you it doesn't have to be that way. We need people in our lives who are willing to look us in the eye and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. He has set you free. Maybe they're going to tell you what you already know. It's time to talk to somebody. It's time to see a doctor. It's time to get out and get some sunshine on your face. I don't know what it is, but he does. And those who love you do too. Oswald Chambers says it this way, and the moment you realize that God's purpose is to get you into a right relationship with himself and then with others, he will reach to the very limits of the universe to help you take the right road. Decide to do it right now by saying yes. Be persistent in prayer to fight the persistence in anxiety. And you 
will discover the releasing power of God's peace in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. I first just want to celebrate with every person who said yes to you, Jesus. Who said, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Set me free once and for all. They are a new creation in you, Lord. And we celebrate with them. Lord, I pray that you would call each of us into community with one another. Whether online or on site or both, Lord, we need one another. The only one who desires us to live in isolation is the enemy. And we don't want to listen to him anymore. We don't want to play in his playground anymore. So Lord, today I pray that you would use this time right now to so pierce our hearts and remind us of your power and your love that is so exceeding, so abundant, so beautiful, so grace-filled and merciful. Call us to the next step, Jesus. Call us to the next thing we need to do so that we can live a life that is free and full and peaceful with you. I thank you and praise you for your word that helps challenge us. Yes, it'll ruffle her feathers. Yes, it'll shake us up. But Lord, you do it all for our good and all for your glory. I thank you and praise you for what you've already done, what you're doing in this very moment, and what you will continue to do from this point forward. I pray this all in your precious and holy name. Amen. Listen, community is key. You need to let people in. We have groups that are going to be starting in the fall. That's a great way to get started. But if you just need somebody to pray with you right now, I want you to do two things. You can either text the word prayer to 937-358-6565. Or you can just type the word prayer in comments and our hosts will begin praying for you right now. Peace, my friends. Peace is what he leaves you when you say yes to him.